<laughs> Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm doing good, Devinder. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing good. Just had my dinner, and I guess you are having your morning coffee. Uh, it's lunchtime, so almost lunchtime. So ah, cool. So before we begin, why don't you give a quick introduction, and then we'll get to the topic that everyone and a lot of people want to know. Sure. Um, eight years ago, I went into the online world full time. I had spent oh, 18 years of my career before that in technical services and healthcare. Uh, got packaged out, was already making a transition, and I started off kind of doing some basic websites. And then I realized pretty quickly, along, websites are only part of the marketing strategy, and then I kind of branched out into PPC, pay-per-click, um, branding, uh, some graphics, and then uh, getting customers' traffic, a little bit of SEO as well. And, and from that, my business has just kind of grown into basically a full-scale agency at this point. So, and that's happened in about eight years. I've probably been online, oh, probably for about 20 or 25 years in one form or another. So I've been pretty familiar with the online world. That's loads of experience, almost two decades. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. And you've seen everything from Nokia phones to Apple iPhones. I actually started off online on a website, uh, on a web service called Delphi and CompuServe. So yeah, I've pretty well seen it all in, in 20 or 25 years. So, yeah. Okay, now let's talk about small businesses, Fortune 500, and how the content marketing revolves around these businesses. Now, majority of us are used to dealing with small businesses and yep. are familiar with their setup. Now, let's just focus on the big brother, the Fortune 500 company. Now, for starters, how would you define a Fortune 500 company? Uh, I kind of define a Fortune 500 as a large business that sits on the stock market of over a thousand employees or more and kind of in the category of that they're a major player in their industry. So... I'll give you a couple examples, not clients of mine, but um, in the hotel industry, Marriott Starwood, who's had some problems lately, they're a Fortune 500. In the uh, grocery business in Canada, Loblaws is a Fortune 500. Currently, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon would be Fortune 500s just because of the income value and, and what they're valued at as well. So you, I, I believe you started as a one-man agency targeting small businesses. So I did. When did you decide to start reaching out to Fortune 500 companies? It fell into me by chance, Devinder. I, I was out for a meeting with a family friend in, in Montreal, of all places, and he said, um, I want to bring somebody uh, to meet you for, for dinner the next day. And the gentleman that walked in was the president of uh, one of the major Fortune 500 companies, and him and I got talking. And we had uh, multiple conversations over a probably a six month period. And he said, I need some consulting. I'm going to hire you. And that's kind of where it started. It was all by chance, to be honest with you. It wasn't even planned. And it wasn't even a spot I had curtailed my business to go. And it wasn't even a spot I thought I'd ever go. So. Okay. For, the, for you, it was sort of a surprise, but talking in ideal terms, like everyone won't get a surprise. So should every agency with small business clients try the fortune 500 route like just to no, test the I, waters and strike gold like you st struck gold but in a different way <laughs> I, I think what you need to do is network your business and you need to kind of get out there and meet the right kind of people and go to the right kind of events and i think that will help you meet those kind of people and not be afraid to talk to these people because you know the really di big difference of fortune 500 vps or or uh or presidents or CEOs or even owners is the reality is they're just people like you and I, they're just at a different pay grade. And that's what you got to realize. So get out and meet some people and go to the right events. That helps. It helps a lot. So, Okay. Now let's talk about the basics of digital marketing. Now, sure. how, how would you define digital marketing from two perspectives? One, as an agency owner wanting to offer digital marketing services to clients and the other as a business owner and listening this podcast and trying to figure out, hey, do I need digital marketing services for my business? So I'm going to take the second one first, if that's okay. Or, yeah. and, and let's start with the business owner. The answer is yes, you need digital marketing services in this day and age. 
Um, the millennials, the Generation Y, the Generation X kids aren't watching traditional TV. They're not reading magazines, and they're frankly um, not even watching the news. So they, the old style of let's throw an ad at you 50 times a day doesn't work for them. Um, they're more likely to be in tune with something on a website or on a YouTube or on a video. So for them, it works. Um, I also think that's the future, and the future is kind of now. So I think you have to go that way. The other thing that's changed that is in the old days, we had this book called the Yellow Pages, which yeah. was the phone book. Really, digital marketing, Google's your phone book today. And that's what people have to realize. So things like traffic, things like where you're found in the online digital world do matter. As an agency offering services, um, I kind of like to sit down with my clients and say, okay, what do you need? And the biggest problem with small businesses is they try and be everywhere. And that is the biggest mistake they can make. They have to go after niche traffic. For example, I have a client who owns a jewelry store. He's also a good friend. And mm -hmm. we talk fondly about his marketing. He's a small business. Him and his wife are partners in their business. And one of the things he said to me about a year ago is, besides online ads, where do I grow my business? And I said, have you looked at Pinterest, for example? And he said, well, why Pinterest? I said, because the market on Pinterest is young females between 25 and 40 with disposable income. So, and, I, and they're the type of people who buy jewelry. So mm -hmm. the point I'm making is you, as, a, as an agency, I always recommend people go beyond their website, go to where their market is and not try and be everywhere. Okay. And you just mentioned pin interest. Pin interest, most people consider it as another social networking website. But in fact, it's, yes. a, it's a sort of a search engine because things that you post on pin interest even rank high in Google search if you, you know, go with similar queries and people get surprised like pin interest. If you have something that's yep. visually presented, I think pin interest is really good way. But then you got to figure out how to get on with it because every platform, be it pin interest or Facebook, does take time. And that is where people like you and me come into the picture of helping, you know, get things yep. set up the right way. Yeah. And it's the same thing as Twitter. A lot of people, if you talk to people, they said Twitter is kind of passe right now. But if you read any of this, the big search engine magazines and search engine journal just did a really good article that said Twitter was one of the top alternatives to Google, to Google search. So these, these networks still have value from a search perspective. There's no question. And that's, that's the key. And they do take time, a lot of time. Yeah. And do you only provide, you know, consultation, like advising business to do a podcast, videos, Facebook ads, or you let them, you know, and then after consultation, you let them hire someone else to implement, or do you provide all in one solution? Like you provide the advice and also implement that advice for businesses. Depends on the client. Really? Um, okay. So when I deal with big Fortune 500s, I'm usually in a consulting perspective or an analytics perspective where we're looking at numbers or we're consulting their team on how to do things or how to get better. Um, with a lot of small businesses, some of the small businesses I deal with have staff that deal with things. So it's a consulting and a setup basis. And some of them do not have staff. So I'm actually doing the work, the actual work. In most cases in the small business realm, I'm actually looking after their websites at least. Whether I look after them or I white label them, I do some white labeling as well with some with some partners. So, um, but they, they fall under my umbrella. So I'm, we're, I'm actually doing the work or my team's doing the work. Yeah, because I think Fortune 500 companies would have big team by themselves as well. So they would just need a direction and they would use their own in-house resources to implement those things. Is that correct? I, that's correct. They And they have different budget. They actually have budgets. I mean, the hardest part with dealing with small businesses, one of my first questions is, what's your marketing budget? And they say, well, I haven't really thought about that. And And the best thing I can give a small business owner the advice is work out your marketing budget that includes your website. That also includes the staff you have posting on Pinterest. If you have staff, say, post on Pinterest or Instagram or Facebook, and that takes three hours a day, that should be factored into that budget or salary as well. So work out a marketing budget. That helps. Okay. Now let's talk about the real thing, the digital marketing tactics. Yeah. Now let's talk from the ground level. Like what are common verticals like paid ads, videos, podcasting, blogging, 
etc that form the part of you know digital marketing strategy in most cases um one of the things i would say these days is video um, okay we're, we're doing a video podcast as we speak but video goes over really really well these days and uh, everything from facebook live to instagram stories to youtube live to uh cho- choose your platform where your where your people are and try to try video um i don't know blogging personally i'm not so sure blogging has the same attraction it did a couple mm-hmm. years ago and or five years ago there's too many blogs out there and they're all regurgitating the same information and it's really hard to develop a new blog in the blogging sphere as far and as it's I'm a clear. slow it's a slow medium like if you post something today it's not going to give you return today it's you got to wait for a six months or year down the yeah. line but videos podcast i think they have more instant appeal I, I would agree with you so much so, so that I've even switched my agency's business blog to all audio and uh, video now. I don't do any more writing for about a month. That's interesting. And part of it is, well, there's two factors in that. One is I'm burned out from writing. I have <laughs> 1,500 blogs, blogs over three different incarnations. You can understand that. And I do enough writing for clients. But the other reason is I really don't like writing for myself anymore. to be honest with you so so my theory is if you don't like doing something either get somebody to do it for you get out of it so we yeah because it. in the end it's all about expressing yourself now earlier you <laughs> used to express in form of text now you're expressing yourself in the form of video but then there's another school of thought who people who intentionally get into video they would say okay i'll post the video but i'll also post the video transcript because i don't want google to hate me right Yeah, but you know what? I pay for PPC ads, so I'm not worried about Google hating me. Go ahead and hate me. That's fine by me, because frankly, in the world of SEO, we all know SEO changes take six to eight months to make. So yeah. if I want results now, I'll just throw money at it. So, <laughs> and and that's the value, and that's the value for any small business owner of online ads. It's you're not you can buy and sell traffic, and and that is a powerful medium. Like. and my next question is kind of related to you know money power like how yeah. does your digital marketing choices differ between a small business and fortune 500 company like because in fortune 500 company you will have little more money corpus to play around with as compared to small business so do your business or digital marketing choices you know change when dealing with different size of business sure they do um couple things are factor one is the budget but also fortune 500 companies are not as progressive as small businesses so it's one of the reasons i love working with small businesses they're prepared to try stuff on their dime so, they're modern they're modern right yeah i'll give you an example uh, a year ago i ran a facebook ad where it was black and white and i turned the picture upside down <laughs> and and so we know in pay per click you pay by the click well so the clicks on this ad went through the roof yeah because the ad, Ad spend on this project was two thousand dollars and turned into an eighty thousand dollar conversion. So it was like it was like jackpot written gold written all over it. And I never would have got away with doing that with a Fortune five hundred company. They like to do things the standard way. They're they're very rigid. They're very policy driven. Uh, where small businesses are not as policy driven, but Sometimes you run into issues, especially when partners or families are partners in the business. That has a whole new complexity that can be really interesting, and it's sometimes about the family relationship and not even about the business. Some days, so. Okay, now you gave an example. Now I'm going to give you my example. For example, consider a shoe brand, right? Now yes. one side you have a local boutique shoe brand. On the other yep. side, you have a shoe brand for a Fortune 500 company. Now. Yep. just looking from outside the scale of audience prospective buyers of shoes from different companies would be hugely different so how does you or any other agency owner factor in differences in the scale of operation products variety and even the level of pricing of products that they are offering to figure out the base of digital marketing process i think what you need to do is take the small business and highlight what makes them different So mm-hmm. there's a really good book um uh and I'm just trying by a guy by the name of Robert Bloom called The Inside Advantage. Mm-hmm. And what Robert talks about in this book and something I wholeheartedly believe in is highlight what makes your company different 
and highlight that and go after those strikes. So you talk about pricing. I don't even suggest fighting your market on price. And the reason I don't believe that is then you're in the race to the bottom and then you're going to end up in a problem with the pricing sooner or later. And once you get known as a bottom feeder, so as a digital marketer, say I was fighting my business on price, once you get to that price point, people come back to you and say, I know you're going to give me a discount. So give them. Yeah. And that's a problem. And, and I don't care if it's digital marketing, if it's real estate, if it's a retail store, don't fight on price. Show what makes your business different. So the shoe brand needs to say, okay, what do we, can we do here to make it different than somebody like a Nike or an Adidas or a New Balance and say, okay, this is what makes our shoes different. Highlight what makes them different. Maybe come out with some different styles and, and to highlight that whole thing. Um, I was listening to a podcast from Digital Marketer the other day, and Molly Pittman was talking about this. And she said, you know, and I forget the brand offhand, but one, and it was about shoes. And she said one of the things that was different was they offered colors like pink and yellows and things like that. So that made this brand that she went to stand out instead of the traditional black or white. That's cool. Yeah, differentiation, product differentiation, standing yeah. out, niching yourself and positioning yourself as a premium, you know, even in, in terms of price point, because once you build that perception of being cheap and offering discount, that remains there. You can't actually change it. It's hard to do that then. Yeah, it's hard to do that. And and the reality too is if you're a small, small brand, your problem is you're not buying stuff for quantities. Like the yeah. Nikes and the Adidas are making stuff in factories by the millions and the small brands just don't have that type of run, right? So. Yeah. Now let's talk about money more and budgets more. Now, now it's given that Fortune 500 companies have deeper pockets and they're yes. ready to spend. How do you convince a small business to budget something substantial for digital marketing that will get that that will get them clients and eventually help them make money because it's hard to convince them. It can be and it can't be. Um, first thing you have to sit down is convince them to. I start with the website always and okay. sort of do a website overall. So is it responsive? Does it reflect what they're doing? Is it easy to read? Is it easy to get along? Is the message on the website clear? And is the website a lead generating website? And I mean that purposely. So a lot of companies like to do things like put sliders. I know you do some web work. Um, I do a lot of web work. Um, I'm not a big fan of sliders. First of Me all, do. websites. I, I think they're a waste of time and space. Yeah. Um, is your phone number and your email address on every page on the website? Is it at the top? Can I find it quickly? Things like that. Then once we, we kind of look at the website, I say, okay, I look at the market of the business and I get to know the business. Um, so is your market a male, say, between 30 and 40? Yes. Where does that male reside? What networks does he hang out on? Um, am I better off throwing Facebook ads or Google ads? And what demographics should I target? What type of sales are you looking at making? So if you're going to target a certain sale category, do I target? I've even gone in those sites in Toronto for clients and targeted the Facebook page of my client's competitors. I've done that. And, and that's easy to do in the Facebook ad manager. Yeah. So, and that's the problem. And if you go into the ad manager, you can actually find out what ads your competitors are running now. Yeah. And there's insights there. So I actually look at stuff like that and say, oh, this is working great. I'll just do it better than they will. And then I'll, and I'll go at them and, uh, and things like that. And, and then you got to go to the client and say, okay, here's analytics. There's so many digital marketers. And I've walked in this time and time again and said to people, how many visitors do you have to your website? I don't know. How did your last online campaign go? I don't know. <laughs> and, and frankly, if you tell me I don't know, I'll put a blindfold on and shoot darts at the dartboard and good luck hitting the center. <clears throat> the point I'm making is numbers are everything. And you need to know what your numbers are. And then you can make the proposal to the client and say, this is what we can do. Okay. And sticking to the similar theme, like sure. Fortune 500 companies would have, would be more than willing to pay for initial consultation as compared to, you know, small businesses. I mean, paid initial consultation as compared. How has been your experience in this regard regarding getting paid for initial consultation? Vis -a -vis uh, it's, a, it's a breeze uh, for me. Um, okay. The Fortune 500s I work with, I sit on digital marketing committees. 
Uh -huh. So these are committees of high level executives and myself and usually an EVP of marketing worldwide and often a couple members of his team. So these are all about consultations. I mean, they're forever looking at numbers and looking at consults and looking at how we can do things better. And that's exactly what these are. So and what about small businesses? Are they willing to pay for initial consultation? Usually not. Yeah. Usually, usually what I'll do is um, I prefer to charge by the project, not by the hour. So okay. my agency. So I don't like the hour model. It's, it's kind of, it's hard. And frankly, if I'm charging by the project, believe me, you factored. I hope none of my clients are watching this. <laughs> you kind of, you kind of factor in a factor, uh, an overage factor. You know that. And yeah. you, you say, okay, this is my hourly rate. This is what I'm, oh, I need to get for this project. This is what the time is going to be. And then you need to spell out your, your definitives and your goals of the project very clearly in a contract. I mean, especially with small businesses, I find it a bigger problem. You need to say, okay, this is what you're going to get, A, B, C, D. If the deliverables change, then the cost of the project changes. It's, very, it's that simple. I mean, And what is the difference in the communication process? Like, are there more in-person meetings when dealing with Fortune 500 businesses as compared to small businesses? Uh, most of my Fortune 500 meetings are either Zoom calls or, um, or go to my meeting calls, but there is some travel there. Um, I've, I probably travel two to three days on an average month. December, I did seven, so that's a little different. Um, in terms of small businesses, small businesses like you in front of them as much as possible. If they're local, I do some small businesses that aren't local, and then that's a, a Zoom call almost always. And the nice thing about a Zoom call is you can record the call and say to the client, here's a recording of the call for you to watch later or refresh your memory. And I always make that available. So let's see. Okay, now let's talk about digital marketing mistakes. So what are the most common mistakes of small and big companies that make while trying to, you know, plan and implement their digital marketing strategy? Uh, small companies uh, and big companies, one, they try and copy a competitor. Don't, and they don't make themselves different. Biggest mistake they make. Number two, they don't know their numbers. Um, comes back to what I talked about earlier. If you don't know your analytics, you can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, small businesses don't throw often enough at ad campaigns or online ad campaigns. So they'll, you know, if you read any of the, the funnels, people say, I'll oh, throw $10 a day at something or $15 a day. I don't think that's enough personally um for you to test the campaign you need to throw a hundred dollars a day for three or four days and then sit down and say okay is this working the more money you throw at it sooner the better off you will be in the long run um they don't adjust fast enough uh big companies so they'll get into a mode where they'll say okay i'm going to spend five grand doing something or ten grand and then they'll spend it all and then look at it instead of adjusting in the middle of a campaign um, and both types of businesses don't always adjust to the climate around. So that, I mean, the political climate and things like that. So if you're running a campaign and say something comes up politically or worldwide, that might interfere with your campaign. I've been in situations where I've told people to pull campaigns in the middle and they'll say, why? And I say, well, it's not politically conducive to what's going on right now. So let's just put a hold on it and let the worldwide climate change. That happens quite a bit. Um, and then they don't, uh, and they don't adjust. Like that's the other problem. And the worst mistake they make: to hire an expert and don't listen to the expert because a friend told them, or in a small business, a family member told them to do something. And I just stand there and put in writing and say, "I'm not advising you to do this, but if you want me to throw money at it, okay." <laughs> that's so common, man. Even on a very micro level, like uh, you're reading something or you're watching some expert talking something, but hey, your best friend said, it's not like this. It's like that. So go there. I had a client, a previous client who I was making lots of money and his family convinced him he didn't have to pay me and he let me go. And his business, his online business tanked because he couldn't execute the way I was. And there's the classic example. And, and he came back to me and I said, you know, after all I went through with the family interference, I wouldn't take you back on as a client if I quadrupled your cost. It's just not worth it. So I, there's an example of the family. Yeah. 
Okay, so when does you as an agency or as an expert decide that the current digital marketing strategy isn't working and it's time to scrap it up and start all over again? It's all based on numbers, Devinder. Okay. If the numbers show it's not working and that's the numbers converting the leads, which convert to sales or business, whatever you want to call it. If it's a social agency, it's converted to awareness because they don't necessarily have a physical product that they sell. But if those numbers aren't working and you have to have a defined period of time. So as when you put together your plan, you say, we're going to A-B test, which means you're basically testing two or three ways of doing something. You do the testing, you invoke the plan, and then if it's just not converting, maybe you don't scrap it. Maybe you put a pause on it and revisit it. And so, so scrapping is not always the best way. Sometimes you just kind of pause it and say, we need to rethink this. And if the numbers aren't converting, yeah, stop. It. No question. And in your paid digital marketing strategy, do you only use Facebook ads or do you use other paid mediums like Google AdSense or maybe Instagram ads? Okay, right now, Facebook ads, uh, I run Google AdWords. I'm actually Google, personally Google AdWords certified, so uh -huh. I run Google ads. Um, Instagram ads, no question, they're owned by Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I've run some Pinterest ads. Uh, they're still a lower cost CPA or cost per acquisition than some other, but, you know, as people go there, um, it's going to increase the cost. Um, I've also run some LinkedIn ads, believe it or not. Uh, LinkedIn ads are really expensive, but yeah. they actually let you target professions. So if you want to target CEOs of X value, LinkedIn's a place to do it. Um, and, and I've even run some Twitter ads. So I've kind of been all over the map. I, I believe YouTube as well via Google AdWords. Yeah, of course. And yeah. do you also do any direct advertising like you have something specific client with specific brand and you know certain websites or blogs are good market for that kind of a brand and you reach out directly to place direct ads do you do that as well i, I don't really specialize in direct ads it's not that's not my agency specialty so we've kind of shunned away from that a little bit and no advertisements on podcasting like on other podcasts. i haven't really done any i haven't really done any direct podcasting ads but as you know, doing I guess is an advertising for your business, right? So, so that that's the paid route. Like, do you also do content marketing? Like, you hire a person who will write a content for a specific business, and then no, I either write a either write a content or do a video for business because the video is still content marketing. Uh, yeah, I've done that with companies where we've produced a video or. Uh, produce content from a, a blogging perspective. I have a content writer that I like to use. As I say, I avoid the writing side if I can possibly do. I'm just kind of burned out. That's, you know, but but yes, the content marketing, but content marketing is so hard to do these days, as you know. It, they, the rewards are five or six months down the road. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the digital marketing trends. So sure. in current times of more audio and video content, which new digital marketing methods are getting more common and more importantly, delivering results? Uh, one would be podcasts, which we're doing here. But the reason podcasts are so popular is people take their phones on the go and they like to multitask. So you and I were talking offline a couple of days ago and I, I said to you, I go for a walk and you go for a walk every night. And I go for a walk and I put a podcast in my ear and I yeah. walk till the podcast is done. So there, there's a good example. Um, in the city of Toronto, I don't drive, believe it or not. So I'm on transit. Well, I'm listening to a podcast transit. So that works. Video works. Uh, people like video. Um, and I did, I've done an experiment, as you know, I do regular Facebook lives even for yeah. my business. And I've walked into events where I don't know people and they say, where do I know you from? Oh yeah, Facebook live. <laughs> so video does, does up awareness. Instagram stories work because that's video. Anything with a picture in it. So if you do Twitter or you do Facebook and you post a picture, that has better results than if you just point text. Um, I would say those are the big things that are working right now. I would say it's harder and harder to get a straight blog that's just straight text to work these days than ever before. There's lots of blogs out there. They're all doing the same thing. They're all talking about the same articles. 
And that's really hard to, to compete with. Um, YouTube and Vimeo have big followings. Uh, places like, uh, you know, iTunes have big followings. So you got to kind of go where the volume is. And on the other end of the spectrum, which digital marketing methods have gone stale and no longer works in your opinion? I think shock marketing. Um, it's one thing to have a time limited offer, but I think the whole, we went through a period a couple of years ago where everything was shock and awe. Do this or you'll lose this. Do this if you lose that. I don't think that works really mm -hmm. well anymore. I think what you need to do from a digital marketer is present the value, the why on people. Going out there and saying from a, mar a digital marketing perspective, something does something isn't good enough. It's why. So let me give you an example. When the MP3 player was announced, Creative Labs, who's a big sound card, said, we have a one terabyte MP3 player. Apple came out and said, we have a, uh, a device that will play 5,000 songs. And Apple caught on because they gave the customer the why 5,000 songs, not a terabyte of space. People don't fall into that trap anymore. So I think that's kind of what's changed. And from the perspective of agency owner like you, what changes are you making in your setup messaging activities to get better clients for your digital marketing services? Great question. Um, I'm moving towards chatbots for one. That's yeah. one of the big things I'm doing. On my website, I've actually added a chat function on the bottom of it so people can get in touch. People like answers really quick. Uh, I never used to take support requests from clients by things like text messaging or, or uh, non-email. I do now, for example. A lot of clients like the immediacy of the phone in their hands, so I've got accommodated that way. Uh, in the last six months, I implemented a help desk ticket system, so if the client doesn't open the ticket, we'll open one for them and send them back one. It just tracks workflow. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm probably not doing as much email marketing as I used to do. I still mm -hmm. do, but email marketing is harder and harder to get stuff into the inbox every day with spam filters and promotions tab in Google, so it's hard. So I'm not doing as much. I'm probably doing more what I call relationship marketing. So I have a chat with somebody on a video, and then I'll say, oh, maybe we should get together to local for a coffee or drink and have a discussion, doing more of that. I think there's more value in that than there is in, in not relationships. So I think relationship marketing is making a, a comeback. So um, those at, as far as your chat bo bots implementation, which service are you using? Are you using many? I'm going to go to many chat on Facebook. In the yeah. next couple, that, you know. That's the most famous one. Like Yeah, of course. And I, I think there's value in that if it's done properly. If it's not done properly, it's like any other tool. It's just abused, right? So Yeah, it can be a big spam headache. Like if you are just yeah. sending people messages that don't make sense. Because if you want to use chatbot, you got to be a little human in your messaging. Like you got to craft your message as if some human sent it. Not like, a you know, hey, go there, sign up, this, this, this. And you forgot this one as well. So that's kind of spammy. I also think if you do chat watching, you make it fun for people. Maybe yeah. maybe break some humor into it and stuff like that. I think that really works in any market. Yeah, a lot of people do it. Like they would add emojis in there. They will add gifs in there just to, you know, break the monotony. Like uh, we are not like doing SMS here. Like it's like real chat like you would do on a messenger with your friend. Like it yeah. will be interrupted with some emojis or maybe some gifs. Maybe you throw in some link to a video. So it's more of a, when you call relationship marketing, it's all about building a relationship on human yes. terms, like be human, right? Yeah, and, and I think, um, and you touch on SMS marketing. I don't think SMS marketing works as well today as it did a year ago. Yeah. I mean, I know I get text messages from marketers and honestly, if I, can't, if I can't stop it, I just block the numbers. I mean, it's, it's yeah. really annoying. Yeah, because there's no personalization. They're sending the same message to everyone. But where, uh, whereas in chatbot, you can actually embed, you know, they have like smart short code. So your message yeah. will have that person's name there and you can, you know, personalize things. Okay, this person said yes to this message. Now don't send this message, but send this message. So there's a level of personalization and who doesn't like to be felt, you know, important. Like if I'm sending a message and praising you, why won't you feel good about it? 
it's like, have you ever gotten an, e- an email off a mailing list and somebody says, dear friend, like, yeah. really? You have my name, so use it, right? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, now, when you get a new client as an agency and you build a website, obviously that website building is on per project basis, like the money. Yes, but when you do the digital marketing on month on month basis, what are your basis for, you know, pricing that service? Like, do you have fixed price per month for specific business or do you price your, you know, uh, service according to the return that person is getting from your service? No, I have a fixed management price. So depending on the complexity of the campaign that they're running. So for example, in a PPC ad campaign, we start at four to $500 Canadian a month to even okay. manage the campaign. Mm-hmm. And I don't, and part of that is I don't want to be dealing with companies that don't have what I call big budgets or medium budgets to deal with. It just doesn't work for my agency. So we, we don't do that. And that, and that, encompass a lot of things. You have to set up the ad, you have to run the ad. And I never run ad spends out of our agency's um, ad account. I always run my ad uh, out of the customer, the client's uh, ad account. That, yeah. that way they're charged directly for the ad spend and you're not on the hook for that if something happens down the line. And they can see it, you know, that things are yeah. getting worked on because if you do it from your account and they say, nothing is happening, we can't see anything happening here. And, and I actually find with ad accounts, you have to educate your clients because the average client, even though they can see it, they don't understand it. So I think part of the whole management process is sitting down with the client and educating them and saying, these are what, where you were at before. These are what the numbers show. This is what your increase are. These are the number of leads. So I'll go back to my jewelry store example. One of the things he does is every customer that walks in the store, he says, that's new. He says, where did you hear about us? And I can guarantee you 95% in his case is either Instagram, a Google search, or, um, or Facebook. I can almost guarantee it. So that means his digital marketing is working because he's drawing new clients into his store. So. That's cool because um, it's all about money, you know, the more you pump in. Yeah. But even if you're pumping more money, but the direction is wrong, you won't get the return. So that's the complicated way. That's where the expert like you come in picture. Yeah, no, no question. And, and you know, it's funny. Uh, clients just need to learn. And, yeah, they want to be empowered. But part of empowering your client is educating them. I'm not a big believer in our agency. There's a lot of agencies out there. They hold their clients kind of as hostage, and they don't educate them. They give them a need to know, not everything. And I think that's a mistake. I think educating your client, they're not going to do it themselves. They don't have time to do it. And they're not good at it, frankly. So, Educate them isn't a bad thing. I We don't take the approach that you shouldn't educate your clients. We actually spend lots of time educating our clients. And do you do this whole ad management by yourself or do you have like a team or employees or subcontracts? What's your setup um, like? Uh, we I do some myself, but I also white label a lot of stuff. So uh, I have a white labeling partner that I use. So depending on, depending on who the client is, there's a couple of clients I like to be hands-on with. Well, and I, as an as an agency owner, I have to be hands-on so I know what's working and what's not working. And the but even when you offload stuff to a white labeling partner or subcontractor, you still have to manage those projects. So you can't take your hands off. Where a lot of agencies make the mistake is they ha- they outsource it and then they say okay i wash my hands of it well it doesn't work that way and most of your clients are like local or they are all spread all over the world like how is the client mix for you um 30 is toronto based and the other 70 percent is all over the place it's interesting the joke in toronto is it's easier to become an expert outside your city not in your city <laughs> because there's a lot of competition in the digital space so i just go out i mean i've I've got a large Twitter following. I've got a large Facebook following. I've been online for longer than a lot of people. So I, ju- I just go after them. That's-, That's cool. Now let's dive into your toolbox. So what oh, are your- my favorite question. <laughs> yeah, this is the favorite section of a lot of people who listen to this because yeah. it, what happens is like, even for me, it's the favorite part because I will listen to some new tool name and then <laughs> after the episode is done, I'll just Google some what's this all about. Let me see if I can try it. So the first question, what are your current five favorite tools that power your online business? Uh, number one is G Suite. 
I would be okay. dead without G Suite. So that's uh, Google's corporate suite that allows you to move Got your it. email, your calendar, and custom. Number two is Trello. I use Trello for all my project management. Uh, I love the pinboard setup. I'm actually a, a PMI designation by trade, which is Project Management International. And I haven't found a all-encompassing project management tool I like. The best thing I find for the agency is Trello. So that works really well. Um, number three, for editing videos, and here's where I go off the board from most people, I love a product called Corel Visual Studio. So I'm not an Adobe fanatic the way a lot of the world is, Me even neither. though I do AD work. Um, <laughs> when they went to the paid model, that was the end of that. I have an old CS2 that I own, but for video, I love Corel Visual Studio. And um, do you know the funny part? I just dropped using uh, for Adobe Photoshop. Like this week, I bought the Affinity Photo, which is like... You and Kim Doyle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And guess what? The UI is almost same as Photoshop and it works as beautiful, as quick as Photoshop. Obviously, a few options here and there are different, but I guess once you start using it, you will figure it out. So, And it's, it's amazing. It looks so good. Yeah, and I do. And I've even done some stuff like people laugh at me. I've done stuff in Corel Draw or I've done stuff in PaintShop Pro, which is also a Corel product. And they both handle layered files, so it's a non-issue. Everybody gets hung up that as an agency, you need Photoshop. I don't agree. No. You need a program that does layered files. Yes, that I agree with. But, you know, so that's three. Is that three or four? <laughs> I think and then, three. And then, my, and then my next tool is HubSpot CRM. Uh, okay. CRM for managing clients. Um, the HubSpot CRM, I let it do all my scheduling. So I don't schedule client appointments as a rule. This one we scheduled, but... If a client calls me and says, I want to schedule an appointment, I send them back a link saying, please schedule it yourself. <laughs> and, the re and the reason for that is clients don't miss appointments if they schedule themselves. So it's mm -hmm. a bit of a tactic on time. Um, and then it, it schedules it right in the CRM. It keeps track of emails. It keeps track of leads. So that's the, the uh, fourth one. And then the fifth one um, is WordPress. Uh, I started my business on WordPress. I love WordPress. I'm, I've been in the WordPress game for over eight or nine years. I've played with Squarespace. I've played with every builder out there. Joomla, Drupal, and I keep coming back to WordPress. So there's, there's the five. And you just mentioned just because you are agency, you got to use Photoshop. There's another misconception. Just because you are an agency, you should be using all Mac, which is not true. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a PC Windows guy, so I do not own one Mac. Same at here. All. Same here. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Same here. Like people get surprised. Oh, do you don't use Mac. Yeah, I don't use Mac. It's not no. you, just because you're using Mac doesn't make you a developer, and using Windows doesn't make you a less developer, I guess. Yeah, but it, it's about it's about how you. I'm, and I don't get. And I, I think you and I have talked about this, the vendor, in many chats we've had is I don't get hung up on the Coke versus Pepsi, Mac versus PC battle. Yeah. I tell my clients, find a tool you like, learn it, master it, and then you'll succeed. It doesn't matter what you use. Okay, so the next question, what, which is your recommended web hosting service? Fight ground every day, all mm -hmm. in. Um, we have so many things in common. Same no. here. I've been using it for the last three years now. Um, I have a mentor who owns a bigger digital agency than I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's where I do all my training. I do training there as well. So, and he recommended SiteGround to me about five years ago. I've never looked back. So, SiteGround. So, what I would also say is I would not recommend anything that endurance goes near or touches. So, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll make that clear on this podcast. I, I do use their one of their hosting for last. 13 or maybe 12 years which is dream host yeah. but that's like when i started like 10 12 yeah. years back and my account is still there like it has like non-important very small website and they still work and it's cheap so i have no complaints there to be honest but yes uh, there are a few iffy brands in that whole group but then people do get attracted because they're selling of it. Their with, price points. Yeah. yeah, the price point is like, uh, w because people have this argument, why should I pay $15 per month when I can get something for $2? And $15 a month, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple, I have four dedicated boxes and you know what category yeah. they're in. So yeah. I, 
you pay for what you get in the hosting game. Yeah. The reason I like SiteGround, and I'll be really frank, is their tech support. I hate chat tech support more than most people. I'm a human person, and their tech support is the best in the business by far. Yeah. So. I've used it a couple of times. The good thing about their side ground, you know, technicians is like they are actually technicians. They understand the technical part. They won't yeah, they rush things under the carpet. Like, okay, do Google search this, that they actually solve your problem. And I've done it like multiple times and, or it's been hundred percent record for them that like they've solved my problem within a few minutes. So I had, an, I had an issue last week. That's worth sharing where, my Let's Encrypt SSL did not renew. And there's an issue right now where they don't always renew. And so I got on the, I got on the uh, chat with SiteGround. And the problem I was having is they renewed the SSL for me, which is fine. I could have done it myself. But the reality is I was getting errors out of the error log on my website. And they're like, oh, we'll just create the error log for you. We'll deal with it. Don't worry about it. And, and a lot of cheaper hosts will say, oh, it's your website causing the problem. Go back and look. And by the way, if you want to stick further, we'll charge you like 80 or 100 bucks to do it. Yeah. And SiteGround just fixes their problems and they take responsibility and they're, they're wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So the next question, which is a recommended page builder, Beaver, Thrive, Elementor, or do you even use one? I'm going to go off. I'm going to go off the board on this one. Um, I, I used to. So I use a little bit of Elementor. And I know you're a Beaver Builder guy. So I, I don't away. hate Elementor. I love it. Don't worry. But the page builder that my site is done with and I do with a lot of client sites, I've gone to Aveda. And Aveda has its own Fusion Builder, page builder yeah. built into the theme. The knock on Aveda that people say is it's resource intensive, my reality is get Aveda off cheap hosting and get it on the proper hosting and there's no issues. So I've become an Aveda fan for about three or four years. Mm -hmm. The drawback is you can't buy an agency license, so I just built the cost of Aveda into every project that I do that's new. That's all. The, so the, Fusion Builder for Aveda is really our number one choice. Our number two choice is Elementor. I do have a client running Beaver Builder right now. It's easy. They're all the same. Really. They're the uh, Avada pricing. Are they like per website install pricing? Yeah, it's sixty nine ninety nine US per site for Aveda, uh -huh. um, but you often can get it on sale like that a Black Friday sale at thirty dollars. So I picked up like ten <laughs> just for future. Uh -huh. um, uh, they work on lifetime updates and six months of uh, support. But frankly, I never extend the support because they have a really good Facebook group. And there's a lot of documentation out there. So, and they're pretty progressive. Um, they are the number one WordPress uh, selling theme of all time, actually. They're mm -hmm. over a million dollars in sales. I first started with a page builder theme actually called Headway Themes. Don't know if you remember Headway Yeah, themes. it was really good when it launched, but they lost their way in between. No, they lost their way. And, I, and frankly, I was sad to see them lose their way. I got to know grant and clay very well and there was some and internal. people are shouting like hell like we paid yeah. for it. Where, are, where are you there's no feature this thing doesn't work actually they had some money problem going on so I no question no question i knew a couple of the um developers very well uh several of them have become friends over the years uh, including one out of australia one out of the u.s and uh, yeah they they lost their way um they're still in business but i don't think they're doing anything uh, there's a couple I think they did launch something different with different brand name. I don't recall, but they did do it. And people said, no, this is, these are again, the headway guys don't buy it. Yeah. You know, the bad perception follows you sometimes. And obviously they, it's, it's not, they, they did something bad about it. It's just, they didn't communicate something was going wrong. If they had communicated that something was going wrong and you can expect something yeah. that we promised we cannot deliver. I think transparency is the key because in the online business, if you think you cannot deliver, at least tell them you cannot deliver because of this reason. A lot of people understand. No one is going to, you know, go to court for fifty dollars spent on a <laughs> on a team. And I've got, and I'm like I was a headway user back at one point X, so I've got a grandfathered lifetime license. And and I think where they ran into problems was they had too many grandfathered licenses. In unlike a product like Kajabi which Kim uses and you've used, I'm sure, which they had founder pricing and then they basically made it clear they would never offer that pricing again, right? Because yeah. you got to 
you got to you got to have a revenue model in the online world to sustain your business. I but think there's a, you know difference like most of these products like Advay Themes and other products when they offer lifetime it's like you pay once you don't pay ever but where at Kajabi you still pay a monthly price. Yeah. I think it pays $99 per month still which is kind of a good you know revenue for the platform because $99 from a client is still a good it's it's certainly better than nothing right if you are not paying anything so there's a difference between because lifetime model is really you know it's really tricky because yeah it's it's tough on the revenue and i and i'm a big fan in our business where we pay for products so if there's a freemium version i'll almost always buy a paid tier because if i keep them in business then i get support so that's you know yeah, kind so of the way i work you said you don't do much email marketing but i guess I have I'll ask you which email marketing service do you use? And I think you know where I'm going to go because we've talked about it. I've so I've really? used Infusionsoft, I've used Active Campaign, I've used everything from Mailchimp to Constant Contact, and I'm now using a service that was developed by a local developer called Groundhog with two yeah. G's dot io. And I think you know where I was going to go there. It's it's a marketing service that runs right in the WordPress dashboard. So it is not a SaaS product. Yeah. They give you the base for free, and then they have uh, freemium add-ons. So, uh, for example, to, to style your contact forms, it's a $7 add-on. If you want to interface with easy downloads, I think it's a $97 add-on. And then you can get all the add-ons for two ninety nine. dollars And which, do, you, do you use some transactional email service with that to send emails? Um, like mail you have or? two options. You can use standard WordPress email, or they will also sell you AWS credits that are really cheap. Yeah, and because under- there is a similar service called MailStore, which yes. you can, you know, it's also a WordPress plugin. You know, you could, people just plug in the AWS account with that, and it's like really cheap. And they also you know, send it from WordPress dashboard, and there's an archive of all the emails that you've sent within the dashboard itself. I, li- cool. I like the I like the product because um, it, I know the developer quite well, and mm-hmm. he uh, he's a 26 year old whiskey. Basically, is what I call Adrian. Um, and if anybody's interested, if you uh, jump over to WP Plugins A to Z, the podcast, um, John Overall did a uh, an interview with Adrian some, I guess, last month, and uh, it will tell you all about the plugin. And it's the easy to use. So okay, that's, so that's what I've got. Any upcoming tool or service that has caught your eye attention? There, there's two. One is Loom. Uh, I've become a Loom fan like you wouldn't believe. Um, <laughs> I, I actually use it for recording videos and shipping them out to people I want to get their attention on. And that works really well. Um, the other tool that we've gone to in our business that's really working out for me right now is a tool called the Awesome Support Plugin. They are a freemium uh, WordPress support uh, plugin that runs right inside the WordPress dashboard. So mm-hmm. that's how we manage all our support. And I've, I've bought extra add-ons. And then um, I wish somebody would hurry up and come up with a social media tool that I actually really like. <laughs> it's, it's, I recently I'm, got that thing, what do you call Social B. And yeah. I logged in. The UI was so overwhelming. I spent a few hours and I connected my accounts. I sent some tests posting but that's about it i don't have time again to get into it i'm using hootsuite right now and i'm looking at options again and every time i look at something i say wait a minute here so i wish somebody would fix that space kind of yeah Yeah, because every all these tools even though they perform kind of a similar functionality on a you know ground level but they have like very different uis like there's buffer a lot of people use buffer instead of Hootsuite. I actually used to use Hootsuite when it came out. Now I'm not recently checked how it looks, how it works. So yeah, I, uh, the issue I have with Hootsuite is on the basic plans and my grandfather plan because I have one. I don't get DMs in Hootsuite anymore, which are private messages. So I have to go to Twitter to check my private messages constantly. And it's it's they stop that to force you to upgrade. But here's the problem: they didn't do it in any of the grandfathered implants, which is hit a real sore point with me. Like, it's like you've had these people that have been with you and I've had an account for probably three or four years. So if I change my pricing, all changes. So if I'm going to do that, 
I better find a new product kind of thing. So, yeah, because I keep it simple. Like I for Facebook, I use the Facebook scheduler tool yeah. to schedule, and for Twitter, I use TweetDeck. So they seem to be working for me, and I've developed a routine. Like I schedule things on weekend, and they drip out the whole week. So that works because I'm not too much on Instagram or Pinterest as of now. I do yeah. post randomly on LinkedIn. I'm still trying to figure out where does LinkedIn fit in things I do, but. Let's see. Try video on LinkedIn. That works really well if you do native video on LinkedIn. That that's going up as a platform. So, yeah, but, that's, but now, yeah, I I hear you. Um, now that's like a real digital marketer speaking. Yes. Uh, thanks. But LinkedIn for me, LinkedIn seems to generate me speaking talks. So that's where that works really well for me. And I've made some good connections off LinkedIn, but you got to be careful because there's a lot of people on LinkedIn who like what I call the shove attitude. So they connect with you, they're an agency, and the next thing you get is a private message saying, here's my 10 offers. And I yeah. always say, that, really? You don't want to build a relationship? Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I don't have many connections on LinkedIn, but guess what? I've received those spam messages on LinkedIn and I've never received a spam message on Facebook, even though I have more connections there. But then I'm very careful who I connect with on Facebook because I need to know a person before I hit the you know accept yeah. button. Or at least I should have seen him do something credible on Facebook before I, you know, jump and say hi hello because facebook can be very alien land as well because a lot of people just make a facebook account for the intention of selling see how you know facebook groups get spammed by a person just yep. ring and he'll just spam the group and then he's get thrown out but his motive is done like mm -hmm. or or what they'll do is they'll create a group and they'll invite all their followers into that group and then they'll spam you and then Facebook will get smart and close the group done, but the damage is done at that point. It's, yeah. it's one of the biggest things I hate with Facebook is it allows a group moderator to invite you to a group and add you to a group without your permission. And they have to change that. Like it's got to change. Yeah. Again, it depends on how you use it. Now, I personally do not invite people who I know would not like or appreciate getting invited i only invite i rarely invite anyone in my group like i only invite if someone said something and I, and he wants to be in the group i invite it otherwise i just send the link to the group if you want please click on you know send request and then we can approve it that's the more natural way of getting people inside your group yeah and and the other thing too is it's the conversations that you have one on one like you you take yourself and myself we've gotten to know each other because we we chat one on one for five minutes here and five minutes there yeah and sometimes it's about what we're doing and sometimes it was like last night you telling me what the weather was like in India if you remember that conversation yeah, yeah we it's it's cold we today that's cold here too and snow <laughs> so, no snow but we here, were. Though. We were chatting about the weather and you say, what's the value of that? Well, you get to know somebody and you get to share a little bit with them and that's important too. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Robert, thank you so much for sparing time and appearing here. Before we wrap this up, any last message for someone who is struggling with their digital marketing service providing to clients as an agency? So as an agency, if you're struggling to provide digital marketing service, what would be your final advice to that person? couple things. One, tell people how you can help them and jump on social media and offer to help some people. So if they have a question, answer the question, give them some advice, maybe throw out a few videos, help them out. The more people you help, the more people will come to you. That's number one. Number two, go to some networking events and choose the right kind of events locally. So get involved in your the BNIs of the world or get involved in Toronto. We have this great entrepreneurs community run by the city. We have great events there or get involved in some of the talks. Meetup.com, Eventbrite will help you find some of those groups. And then just work on your business and don't get frustrated. That's the other thing. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks for having me, Devinder. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.